Through the Thursdays of the fall semester, I will be preaching out of the Psalms. Makes sense that we start with Psalm 1. (laughs) Happy are those who do not follow the advice of the wicked, or take the paths that sinners tread, or sit in the seat of scoffers. But their delight is in the law of the Lord. And on his law, they meditate day and night. They're like trees planted by streams of water, which yield their fruit in its season, and their leaves do not wither, and all they do, they prosper. The wicked are not so, but are like chaff that the wind drives away. Therefore, the wicked will not stand in the judgment, nor sinners in the congregation of the righteous. For the Lord watches over the way of the righteous, but the way of the wicked will perish. The word of the Lord. Holy God, we've gathered here in front of your open word, asking that your spirit will carry it deep into our lives, that we might be transformed closer into the image of the word made flesh, in whose name we pray. Amen. The first psalm is a beatitude. Like all the beatitudes, it begins with, happy are those who, or as the old NRSV used to say, blessed are those who. This says, blessed are those whose delight is in the law of the Lord. And by law, it's referring not just to the Ten Commandments, but to the whole tradition of the Torah. Blessed are those who delight in their tradition. These are strange words today because for so long we've heard that we can be whoever we want to be unencumbered by any claims from a tradition. It's up to you to choose your future, they told us. You get to decide where you will go to school, where you will work, where you will live, who you will marry, if you will marry, what your values will be. And no one has a right to make any judgment upon these choices because it's your life. You get to choose. And this they presented to us as the path to being happy. What they didn't tell us is how to know what to choose. When we dismantled the claims of tradition upon individuals, we assumed that they inherently knew who they were and what they wanted. But ironically, by uprooting people from tradition, we've made it possible for them to have any of this critical insight. Who we are, what are our purposes. Which means that we are left on our own to try to self-construct what we think will be a good life. And the only way we know how to do that is by making choices. We're big on making choices. Anyone who's done parenting the last two generations know it's all about helping kids make choices. We got that message. But the assumption is you can choose your way into a good life. And if you don't like the life you have, you just choose again. You don't like your major, pick another major. That stays with us. If you don't like the job you have, Choose another job. You don't like your community? Go to another community. You don't like your church? Choose another one. Now, choices are wonderful things. They're blessings to have, and we have to make them. But be clear, you're never going to choose your way into a good life. Eventually, the years start to pile up, and you realize you've wasted most of them basically just rearranging the furniture with your choices. You haven't really changed who you are. As one of my parishioners once told me, an older man, he says, you get to a point in life when you realize all the interesting choices are behind you, and from here on out, it's just consequences. (laughs) It's kind of a despairing discovery that with all of these choices, We haven't entered anything near a beatitude. 
If that's your strategy for being happy, the psalmist says you will be like chafe blown about by the wind. The alternative that the psalm provides is to be a tree planted by flowing streams of water. The stream is the great tradition that began long before us, but now flows its way into our place and time. To be planted by this tradition is to come to worship repeatedly, where we are renewed in the conviction that our identity and our mission is not something we construct on our own, it is rather a holy inheritance. Every time we worship, the stream of this tradition flows by us. Abraham and Sarah leaving comfort in order to begin a journey with God. Jacob staying up all night wrestling with God. The Hebrews on the long, meandering journey on the way to a promised land. Rahab's heroic choices. Esther coming to a kingdom for such a time as this. James and John abandoning their nets to follow a Savior. Peter's dark moment of despair after he denied his Savior. And his moment of glorious hope when he encountered the risen Christ. Paul discovering that he'd been wrong about God and wrong about Jesus, and in his conversion, being called to be an apostle. Revelation's great tree of life with, with leaves for the healing of the nations. That's not their stories. That's our story. And through the Holy Spirit, you can find yourself on every page of this story. For when we worship, we worship out of this text and we find ourselves within it and our lives discover their identity and are renewed in their mission. The best part of the story is the word that was with God and the word that was God became flesh and dwelt among us. And the part of the story about how he went to the cross to die for our sins, how he rose to give us new life, how he ascended at the right hand of God to, to reign over his coming kingdom and how the Holy Spirit engrafts you, adopts you into the Son's beloved relationship with the Father, making you also the beloved of God that you might live in Christ and participate in his identity and in his mission. Every time churches gather as part of their liturgy and engage in a baptism, it isn't just the baptized who is blessed. Everyone in the room is renewed in their identity as the people who now live in Christ and are called to work in their corner of the world for his mission for all the world. That's what liturgy has to do. As you know, liturgy comes from the Greek word or actually two words, laos, the people, ergon, work, public work. Remember, before these words were given religious significance, they had a common meaning. People who were building roads or who were in public service or doing charity, they were all doing liturgy for the sake of the public. So when society heard the early church referring to its worship service as a liturgy, they knew that the Christians were worshiping God for the public good. The Greeks had another word for private religious rituals, which was orgia. And you know what we've done with that word. <laughs> the thing that protects our worship from turning into a sentimental spiritual orgy is that it renews us in our identity in Christ and in our mission. It plants us firmly into who we are and what we are about. Being planted by the stream, we are nourished 
by this tradition that flows by us. It gives us our life. It allows us to bear fruit. But the fruit is not for the tree, right? The fruit is for the healing of the nations. So we do not worship like boxers who retire to their corner because they're beaten up by the struggles of life. No, we worship to encounter the word of God because Along the way in the journey, we hear so many blasphemous words that lie to us. Words that say you really are on your own. It's up to you to build your life. you got to take what you can in constructing this life. And, by the way, be very, very worried about them. They're going to try to take something away from you. They're not like us. They come from someplace else. Be afraid of them. But in churches around the world, the diverse body of Christ gathers to remember there is no them, there's just us. People of every color under the sun. Rich people and poor people, men and women, young and old, sinners and, well, sinners. (laughs) But all of us gather together and worship and we refuse to be afraid of them. Instead, be afraid of fear because it distracts you. It preoccupies you with yourself and that makes it impossible to participate in the mission of Christ. It makes it impossible to care. That's not our tradition. That's not how your story goes. From the very first pages of the book, the tradition tells us you were created to care. In the name of the Father, Son, and Spirit, amen.